to 7 p.m. Um, we have um, some of our regular speakers here, and, think, and as well as um, my friend Erin Fogg, who was in a protest in Fort Wayne, Indiana last night, and she was assaulted and tear gassed and battered and pursued by police. And uh, she's going to tell us about that experience, and um, I'm sure is just nothing less than harrowing. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for being a civically engaged person with the courage to go stand up to authority for the rights of everyone in this room. So thanks. Thank you. I'm, I'm especially glad to be here today because there were quite a few moments last night where I really wasn't sure. So kind of a little bit of backstory is I'm I, not from Indiana. I live in Indiana um, and I'm running for a county council at large where the county has about 350,000 people. We have a county budget of $112 million. 70% of that goes to the sheriff's department. So I ran for the office, I started in February, specifically to push a prison abolition platform uh, to defund the sheriff, which is kind of the only, like, we can't touch Fort Wayne City. We can control the sheriff in the county jail. So I've been on this prison abolition tip for a minute. So the protests, like, I don't know, everyone kind of sensed it wasn't going to be easy, it wasn't going to be fun, it was probably going to be a long night. It's a Friday. Most of us have been quarantined and good about it for months. It was the first time I saw people in three months. And the first time I saw people in three months, I was breathing all over every one of them. It was awful. And the weather was nice. And, you know, so we don't usually have very good protest turnouts. I've run a couple of... Uh, abortion, anti-war, you know, you can get 20 people and you're satisfied. Like, that's a really good turnout. There's a very low threshold for any sort of radicalization. Uh, running as an open socialist is super fun because they'll call any Democrat a commie, so might as well lean into it. So I get to the protest at about 6. It had been going on for about an hour. There were hundreds of people there. There were hundreds and hundreds of people there young and old and black and brown and white, and it was beautiful. It was the most beautiful thing I've seen in my life. And everyone was together walking. It was so peaceful. There's about a, it's a three-lane wide, one-way street, and the county courthouse has, it's like the town square. It's kind of, we call it the green, and it's surrounded by wide, one-way streets. And we traditionally protest at the courthouse. We'll take to the street sometimes, do a couple of laps. We wanted to walk to the Martin Luther King Bridge from the courthouse. And that necessitated, it was necessary to do it in the street and block off traffic. And there weren't any cops. So at that time, I couldn't find any of my people because at that time we were all masked up. It was, it was busy and everyone was just kind of finding their naturally find your role in a group like the communication you do it silently when a group is working with a single purpose and at that time i was watching traffic and keeping the cars off of the marchers because there weren't any cops we just had to rely on traffic lights and brute force to, to be successful and to be safe i got hit by two cars and a motorcycle i don't i mean i wasn't hit hit they deliberately made contact with my body with their vehicles because they wanted to move their cars through protesters. The slightest amount of inconvenience for so many of these people made them rage like it was so scary. And it was so beautiful then, you know what I mean? Because we were working together to keep ourselves safe from people who would do us harm. There were two semis that were like stuck in traffic. Um, a UPS one, and of course, we love the UPS, it's the only good government. And some big yellow semi, and some teenage kids, like, climbed up on it. There were some white anarchists who were doing sweet skateboard tricks underneath the semis. I'm sure people saw seeds of it. It was cool. It was dumb as hell, but it was cool. And then a group of, like, young black kids were sitting on the yellow semi. The driver of the semi gave them explicit permission to do it. He was totally cool with it. There was a dude on one of the other streets that was stopped, like the cross street, sitting on his car smoking a joint. We were having a good time. 
we were working together to get the semis out. We were letting cars out, who like families, people who really needed to go somewhere. Because by then, we'd been there long enough that they had to have known. There are only a few people who were legitimately stuck. There were many people making multiple laps. There's a feed somewhere out there where I'm chewing out a guy in a beamer and in 15 minutes yell at him that we just had this conversation because he was creeping on protesters with seven engines on them. So we're trying to keep these cars off, moving cars and letting people through. Like, we were policing ourselves. We were policing the city. We were being successful. And the police came out in riot gear. They all came out really fast out of nowhere. And they didn't say a word. They didn't tell us anything. There was no loudspeaker. There was no warning. There was no order given. And they just started macing people. They maced children who were just there. Because it's, it's a nice part of town. People like to be there. It should be safe for you to be there with your family. And we were making it safe for people to be there with their family. And they came out and they just started. So at that point, we we're talking about a territory. There's one city block long plus two intersections. At that time, we were all fully in the intersection. The cops were on the far end of it on that cross parade, and they lined up. They got their batons out, and they started marching on us. They would take a step, move, move, move. And I was on the front line for a lot of it because there were a lot of black people there. And cops said it. And there were a lot of white people who put their bodies consistently to believe they hate that. They specifically targeted those So we're at the top of the intersection. Cops are lined up. The toms are out. They're marching on us. We're standing just far away. And that, like, I played the I'm not touching you game for about maybe a fifth of the block like slow little steps, like we weren't, we weren't touching them. We, we didn't want them to touch us. We weren't resisting, but we needed to be in that street. So about a third of the way down, they kind of stopped. They're moving around in the background. And at that point, we were on our knees with our hands up. We're asking them to arrest us. To not hurt anybody, but if we were hurting, if we were breaking the law so bad, just arrest us already. And that's when they started shooting tear gas canisters at us. They shot them at our bodies. They were aiming for our bodies. Over and this is about 6.30 when they started gassing us, and they did it until I, I left at 11, and they gassed us the whole time. So we seated ground. There were a lot of people on the green at that point. And Traditionally, when we protest here, the green is it's a safe zone. It means you're, you're not there to cause trouble. You're just there to be with your community. And they started firing on the people of the green. And they were firing on the people in the street. And I didn't know where they wanted us to go. I mean, I knew they wanted us to go home. That's all they wanted. They wanted us to just say, okay, you win. We'll do what you say, and we'll go home. But you can't reward them. You can't let them do it. Because we have seen, we've seen every day for how long now, what they'll do. So then over the course of the next few hours, take the entire street to bring in the Bearcats, to bring in the shotgun squad, to bring in the extra um, city cops in riot gear, Bring in the county SWAT team. They had two militarized, militarized armored trucks, snipers on top, and we knew, you know, we were fucking with them, like we were dunking on them. We were because it's opera, like it's theater. They're trying to scare us. They want us to believe that they will shoot us. Okay, uh, it took probably I, I don't know an hour or so maybe for them to claim the whole block in front of the green. On the corner, there's this you know, bougie little artisan farm to whatever 
the hoppy gnome. Oh, it's a micro guest. I don't know what it is. I can't afford to eat. But it was packed, and people were sitting out eating their food. I know that because I saw them when I ran around the corner to run away from being dead. And they're sitting there going, oh, what's all this fuss about? Because they can't see around the corner. They can't see a line of cops and riot gear storming toward us. They can't see the street filling us. And then they just kept gassing us. And the people in the restaurant were trapped. And they just kept watching us. And they kept watching us pour water milk, anything we could get, kept passing. And they watched us through the windows. They live-streamed it. And they didn't try to help. So at this point, we're, the cops have pretty well gotten most of us to both intersections. We really couldn't tell what was going on at the other end of the block. Um, there was so much smoke. Uh, some of the protesters had rainbow smoke bombs. And that was cool for like a couple of minutes until they started firing gas cartridges. Set them off. They got a girl, she's so young, like 19, and she fell and they kept firing. And that, by then it was still light. It was 7 o'clock. He'd already filled the town with this poison. And nobody even thrown a bottle yet. The bottles, they started throwing them. They did. Of course, but we, are, we had already been pushed all the way down. Onto the far corner, I guess, on Clinton or Barry. I don't remember. I'm bad with geography, which is not great in... Something where you need to be fairly tactical about your positioning. They had us down there and a cup of water bottles, and it would escalate. It escalated over the next hour or so. There was some blasts. There was, there was like, I think it was a, um, what, is, what size does milk come in? Gallons and half gallons, pints. Of course, it was the skinny milk got thrown at them. None of them got hurt. We barely even, they barely even got dinged by half-empty fucking water bottles. We just kept gas. All, all the community is hearing right now is that we were trashing cars. We were on cars. We were throwing bottles. We were tearing down statues. We were breaking windows and looting. And that's why they started gas. No, it's I'm simply sure. not true. The first window was the window they broke when they shot a gas canister through it. It was the courthouse window. By then it was dark. I, oh, they had, they had said finally, they had announced that they were going to arrest us. They said we were unlawfully gathered and that we'd be facing arrest if we didn't disperse. And it was the first time we'd been told that we'd offered ourselves to be arrested over and over. We kept begging them. We kept going on our knees in the street, begging them to arrest us. It just got fired. So by 8, it was, it was supposed to be over by then. Didn't you finish your protest? Go home. They said they'd start arresting us, and then they started driving us away from the courthouse. And this is the part I don't understand, because one of two things happened last night. Either the militarized police force of the city of 275,000 was so clueless, had no plan, had no strategy, that they thought the best thing to get this thing over with was to disperse us into the city, was to force us deeper into the city and to scatter. They were either so grossly incompetent that they thought that was a good idea, or they did it on purpose because they wanted a riot. Because how do you get a riot? It's by forcing people to scatter and go deeper. You take away any rule of law. Why wouldn't some angry teenage kid smash a window and you just set us running for our lives in the city we live in? We had to run through the streets. We had to run through alleys. We had to hide in parking garages so they wouldn't hit our bodies. Gas canisters. They were aiming at. We ran and we hid. But on every corner, there were different cops.
much fun. I recorded it with a different agitator. People were still driving around. It was it was a big party to a lot of people, but we weren't any of those people. There were teenagers who smashed windows. I saw a bunch of them. They just walked by. I believe what they did, this is what they did. Fuck 12. Bam. Walk. Fuck 12. Bam. Because you know what? Fuck 12. Fuck 12. They attacked our city because we asked them to stop killing black people. When you ask the police to stop killing black people, their answer will be no. And we'll take you out too while we're at it. I've never experienced a protest. I've been in the streets so many times. When Trump was elected, we went to Indianapolis and took this whole fucking city for a couple hours. Cops let us take the whole thing. We just wandered around. It was great. But this wasn't a protest. It was a trap. No matter what we would have done, we, we could have been perfect and they would have come out like they did. And we have to figure out right now, all of us together, where we live. We have to figure out how to make them stop. And we have to get serious about taking care of each other. Because we have to make socialism. They're choosing farmers. And too many of our neighbors are willing to let them do it. My battery is dying in my headset. Can I go off for a minute? Can that be the end for right now? And we'll take some questions. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, you can take all the time you need. No, I just... I just need to switch my headphones, your time. Sure. Um, if anyone has anything to say, please. I feel like I need to apologize for being traumatized by what was a very traumatic experience. No, I just wanted to thank you so much for sharing. And thank you so much for being there. No, thank you. I wish we didn't have to. I wish none of us had to do any of this. It seems such a small thing to ask of our government. To not kill us. And I was without a mask for most of it. Because I had an N95. Um, I have a fairly severe uh, genetic tissue disorder. Um, I really should not get COVID. It won't be good if I get it. But I'd gotten gassed enough that my mask was soaking wet. And you actually can't breathe through a wet N95. So all of the bravest loudest black and brown and white people in my city turned out with justice during a killer respiratory virus. And they spent hours gassing up. What is it better? Is it better if it's incompetence or if it's deliberate? I think uh, one of the things that I, that's been really um, weighing on me for years now, I'm sure a lot of people, uh, is that we keep giving the police the same weapons over and over. Uh, we, we give them lethal weapons. We give them training to do these things. We give them the riot gear. We bought all of these things for them. And we I don't want to buy these things for them so anymore. Much. We paid yeah. so much for it, Wayne taxpayers. I can't imagine what the bill was. For I feel like they have too many of these. Uh, they can, they, they're treating them like toys. And uh, no, you know, using them against so ourselves. Stoked. They were so excited to get to play with their toys because they got to shoot people. They were taking turns shooting people and they were so excited. And you could, they were getting so itchy. We were, we were really afraid that they were going to pull out the rubber bullets. I, they may have, I, I, I may, I may have left before they did. Because those are they, like pellet guns. They're, they're, they're real bullets. They can kill you. They just have a slight rubber coating on them. They're not. None of it is non-lethal. Tear yeah, gas so is lethal. Like, you get hit in the head with one of those, it'll kill you. Yeah, so rubber the bullets are lethal. They're not supposed to fire them directly at you. They're supposed to fire them on the ground. And yeah, they're, they're not supposed to shoot yeah. C4 directly at you either. But they, they did it. They were supposed to, was the problem. They were supposed to come out with these things that we bought for them, and we trained them to do this. And we, we have to stop them. it. Not no, why would, we didn't... We, why would we let them, why would they bring out a militarized vehicle with a sniper on top if we didn't have it in the first place? Of course they're going to bring it out. 
I think they're we have to admit power. that we as a society have allowed this to happen because we are allowing the police force to train mm -hmm. them to do these things. And if they didn't get any training, what the hell are they doing on the streets? They need oh, to, you know. They don't get nearly enough training. Seriously. <laughs> I think the problem, and their training doesn't say let's let's behave in a way that is responsible and that doesn't um, require us to use any of these weapons ever. Never have to use them. I think a lot of the problem is that the mission of the police itself is primarily to protect property and you know to protect the stores and investments of, of people in uh, in the community. It's not really to preserve life for the most part and. When you kind of approach it from that point, you, you get the the police begin to think that the uh, public is the adversary that they have to control, and you get that like mm -hmm. line bullshit they're uh, always talking about. And um, the 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 relationship is poisoned even before you begin. And I, I think obviously the the racial aspect is, is is big and and highly publicized. But I think at a fundamental conceptual level, the the mission of the police to, is pretty much broken. Well, and as a prison abolitionist, part of that is, I mean, it's an end goal in the same way that Medicare for All is kind of the end goal. I I think just like with Medicare for All, we can just fucking do it if we want to. Like, we can just empty the jails. We really can. There's nothing stopping us. Um, I agree with but, you, Aaron. We, I yeah, absolutely we, agree. There's but, nothing stopping us except that we won't do it. We, right. we don't have the will to do it. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with Moto. I think the issue isn't training. The police are trained very well to do what they are supposed to do. The issue is what they're supposed to do, which is protect property uh, and not protect poor people and terrorize poor people sometimes. So, the police, the police yeah. protect capitalism and they serve white supremacy. They literally do nothing else. Yeah. And we're, we've seen it. We're seeing it. Everyone is seeing it in the way, you know, like... Being terrorized by the police, yeah, this is that's a first for me as a forty-year-old white lady. Yep, but how many families, how many families feel the same way every day? My parents now worry that I'm going to be killed by the cops because I'm being highly visibly going after my local cops, and now they all know my face and name. No one should have to worry that your kid's going to get murdered by the cops. I'd like to get um, I'd like to get um, everyone here to know your name, though. <laughs> I mean, yeah. your name is so Aaron I mean, Fogg, right? Yes, you are. And my name, yeah. I, I mean, I think at this point we have to be proud of what you're doing. I'm really proud of you, and I'm proud of every single person I saw in that assembly who did who chose not to do something violent back. They were so. I've never seen such bravery. Or such cowardice, this whole thing, everyone, you know, we live in a simulation and COVID has made everything feel just so especially surreal. But I don't know so if we I, can handle this level of dialectics on a daily basis. Like, <laughs> the, the contradictions are too big. The first thing I asked you today when I, um, when we were about to meet was whether you had a chance to like shower and wash and get a rest before you came on the show and um, your response. Oh, I'm a mess. I did, I showered. Pro tip about tear gas, cold water. I was so excited to get in the shower. It was like 3 a.m. because, oh, right, I, I left. The only reason I left the protest is because the cop's body slammed my medic buddy and framed him for throwing the milk jug earlier. He didn't fucking do it. He didn't fucking do it. But he's a loud, obnoxious, vocal, like, protester. He knows what he's doing. And they fucking railroaded him. That was 1030. That's when I left because I wanted to try to make sure he was safe and he got, got bail and shit. I didn't find out what he, that he was even booked until like eight this morning because they were booking people late, 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 late. And he's being held uh, without bonds on Monday. But they threw him like, and that's what I mean when they were it, white people putting themselves in between cops and black bodies really makes the cops mad because the white people who did that are the ones they targeted.
They had to get blood that night. I want to say tonight because I haven't slept. I did shower. I haven't eaten. They were out for blood, and they knew they couldn't beat up a black guy. And they're for sure not going to beat up a nice white lady who's a pain in the ass. But they can beat up some white protester kid. That's all right. So until I hear on Monday that he actually is safe and didn't get rough ridden, I have to assume otherwise. Because the cops will do what they want. And if we just say, please don't, they'll keep doing it. So the solution cannot be more training. It has to be a complete abolition and disbandment. We have, there are theories, there are frameworks, there are structures that we can put into place. We can do restorative justice, we can do community policing, we can do community defense. These are all actionable things that we just have to want to do. And we have to want to do them together because the police won't stop until every person in this country is underneath their so this feels like a, when you were there, it felt like a race war, even though there were people of all different races in the streets, but it's still in the It felt like a war. It, it felt like a war straight up. But I mean, I guess, I don't know. I don't know what being in a war is like, but I know what it feels like to run for your life. And I know what it feels like to drop to the ground because a stranger is balled up in pain and you have to help. And at least, at least last night, yeah, no, there are people who, who you just you need to protect a little bit extra. I wasn't protecting white men, <laughs> I guess is the only one. They were, white men had to fend for themselves last night. Not everybody That's else unfortunate. Well, I'm saying for me personally, like, no, the, the young girls, like, the teenage, like, e-girls, these cute little cutie pies like they should be hanging out on tiktok and having fun and they were out there crushing it and the police were brutalizing them so I um i think we have to find a way to um give the police a whole different set of training a whole different set of tools my thing is uh i'm i'm for the taco truck revolution i think the police people should be sending out the taco truck we'll start protesting have you thought about what other tools we what? could give them? Because I hear a lot of complaints, but I don't hear the solutions. And I want well, to, I, the, I want to find solutions. They're given too much power already. They're given too much power already. We need to stop letting them lay the groundwork. Stop letting them lay the rules because it's, it's already a power imbalance. Um, and they need to know that they are not in charge. The communities are in charge. The people in the community are, are in charge and they have to report to us. Like they do not try to like what pound us into submission. Like that's yeah. And that's yeah. Cool. They well, restrictions. Well, I no, they no, that. they need to not exist because yeah, that's what, also an option. I can no, get behind. they straight up need to not exist. Um, the the ch the challenge. I actually be... oh shit I had I had a thought on that one I lost it. Um, <laughs> okay, so the <laughs> question is. What okay. other tools we could give the police people? Okay, supposing we still have police, but instead oh, I remember. of riot gear and tear gas and so forth to, to deal with these situations, what if we gave them taco trucks and a squadron of cheerleaders and a, and a phalanx of, uh, of pencil pushers that show up to the place and take everybody's uh, complaints, you know, and push it back up to the correct people who could do something about it? I mean, wouldn't that have been something to see instead of seeing a bunch of people in riot gear oh, yeah. about ready to attack you? Okay, so I'm 100% on board with that. But what we do with every corrections officer, what we do with every police officer right now, they do not get to do their jobs anymore. They do not get to work with people anymore. The only job they are suitable for, I hand to God, the only job retraining program I will support is training them to be social media content moderators. Content moderating hurts. Yeah actual workers we can't robotize it actual people are sitting in call centers watching the worst things in the world happen on facebook and it's giving them crazy ptsd so the retraining what we will do is we will take cops and corrections officers who are so corrupt have such a fake job that the iww won't allow them in membership because prison work is not real work. Police work is not real work. Keeping people in cages is not a job. So that's what they get to do.
they can get their kicks off looking at people hurting on the internet so healthy people don't have to subject themselves to it. And then we'll start the taco truck revolution with regular people who don't like seeing people bleed. Because that is what the police have become. We've let them do it. We've taught them to like killing us. They're not going to stop. We have like um, conflict mediators who were empowered to come in and talk to people specifically, that that was their job instead of coming in to arrest people. If your job was to, if you were a counselor who was trained to come in there and de-escalate the situation, that would be a much more um, useful service to our communities, I think. Absolutely. And even, even like a, a European model would be a step in the right direction, not that they're ideal, but I think like if you look at uh, the fatality rates, even if you just look at like white men, the, the American uh, police death rate is like several times greater than uh, in a typical European country. Uh, oh, yeah. We just, uh, yeah, our, our, our police fatality rate is, is, is off the charts. Um, I think, and a lot of the times for them, they, they limit how armed the, the police are. Even that, don't make it easy for them to just pull out a gun and, and clock somebody. You got to, you know, you have to call in like SWAT or like have a really good reason to uh, call in the heavy guns and not just uh, because somebody made you a little nervous when they were, when you pulled them over for, you know, going 10 miles over the speed limit. Well, and that's exactly it. Like they get to hide behind this public facade of being a brave hero when they're so scared at their shadows that they'll accidentally shoot their own dicks off like they're really bad at their jobs and it's not because of training it's because we let them be we're giving them the wrong uh like um wrong mission the mission that we send them to do is to clear the streets but the mission that we have to have these people go out to do and if it's not the police it could be some other group but we don't have this group we need a group of people who are sent out into the streets to listen to the people, to take down their complaints, and to pass it up to the right people who can do something about it. That's a responsive government. A responsive government says, hey, the people are unhappy. We go out and we listen to them, and we make a giant show of listening, right? We don't just listen like, oh, we're, we're kind of listening by watching YouTube. And, you know, we listen by actually getting people who write down everything and put it back to the legislator to you know, a bureaucrat or whoever it is that it's responsible for making these changes. Talk to the police chief. Okay, is this is this problem something that needs to be addressed by the police chief? That's where we send it. Okay, so but we don't know how the people are protesting because we don't know how to move the government. We don't know who to talk to. We don't have the connections. We don't have their cell phone number. Oh, it doesn't you know? matter. No, only riots will fix this. We all every police station is a Bastille. The riots have to happen because. It, it took three days of straight rioting to even get the cop charged in the first place in Minneapolis. We had to riot for three days just to get bullshit, like, not even real <laughs> How does it help to get them charged? What The only thing that I see helping is the people's demands are met and the people's demands are heard. But what are the demands? We don't even know them. All we know That's is the, that we don't want well, we do know people to die, you know? How about a basic I think that kind of speaks to a, a larger issue with, uh, I think everyone has, kind of has a tendency to project their own political agendas onto riots when riots are closer to like a, a natural, like, I don't want to say disaster, but a natural uh, reaction. Um, it's closer to like a flood or a tornado. Um, I actually, we, I disagree very vehemently with that. Well, the, the, the um, reason I say that is there's not, there's not a political program for these demands there's not a a it's, channel I, that's I, a lot of disparate uh anger and rage that's kind of formless and i think the problem is we're not in the we're not none of us are in the position to capitalize on this and to to put it into a, a good position unfortunately no we can give it a little bit of form right now we're not going to um, do it well, all ourselves, well i mean we we, you know, we can we can present there. we can make an offer essentially is what we we're can. doing but the, these so if i can if i can speak slight in defense of riots slightly my perspective is it's less about the goal and more about the extreme logical and rational nature of rioting uh, I'm not okay. saying it's irrational. I'm, I'm saying that it, it's not. Uh, it's not necessarily in and of itself political in as like an actual political motive uh, organized force. So it doesn't mean that 
There's a terrific piece, Counterpunch has a wonderful piece called The Poor Person's Defensive Riots that I've been spamming on people like crazy because it talks about kind of exactly what you're talking about, that there's political action and there's direct action. Riots are direct action. The protest was political action right up until they started chasing us in the streets and we had to start that's when we found traffic cones we were kicking things back the whole time um but when you have to start fighting on your own that's when it's direct action so looting is the most purest form of direct action because you are going to a store you are taking the food and you are putting it in your home you are going and getting the thing that you need and taking it with you Riots are they're not interchangeable with looting. There was no looting in Fort Wayne. If anybody tells you otherwise, they're, they're lying. They smashed up a bunch of glass, but there wasn't any loot. The, the riots, they, they feel very formless because they're collective actions. Like, I, I'm so sad that the cops had to ruin what could have been such a fun intellectual exercise in collectivism. Because the way a crowd moves is fluid and seamless and quiet. Everyone just knows what to do. And you have to keep in mind that the disruption could have also been caused by police. The rioting last night. Yes. Uh, yeah. The rioting happened. We did have a riot in Fort Wayne. By my definition, absolutely we did. And that happened the second they tear gassed the courthouse window trying to chase us away from the courthouse. Once they, the second they chased us into the city itself is the second it became a riot because they didn't give us a choice. And when you've got all those scared, angry people who were in physical and emotional pain, who are now just kind of set loose on their own, they don't know where their friends are, they're disoriented, and the cops are chasing them through the streets. Yeah, 16-year-old kids are going to punch a window. That's... It, it, if they had any interest in not having a riot happen, they wouldn't have done a single thing that they did. And, and that's the thing, the, is it the incompetence or was that the plan and does it make a difference? Is one of them worse than the other? Well, a riot justifies their existence, right? Like violence scares They came people. for a riot. They came and rioted here when everything was hunky-dory. Somebody sitting on a semi you know what I mean? Like people goofing off and being in the street isn't a riot. You don't show up with a tank, but that's what they did. And the city's my experience. Seen. Yeah, it's been my experience that um, scared people often create the reality that they're afraid of. Okay, so mm -hmm. if you're terrified of a riot and then go up in riot gear and then you create the riot that you were afraid of. If you showed up with a taco truck, uh, who's going to riot? They're going to come buy some tacos. Yeah. Social media on the other side of this, too, remember. They have been being fed by their um, buddies online that this is going to get to the point of rioting. They are prepped for this situation because their own friends are sitting there hyping up the idea in their head. They're saying, we're going to have to take to the streets. We're going to have to maintain order. They were saying this for months now because of COVID. They were expecting riots already. So these cops have been like on edge expecting it and they took it out on you guys and it's just it's horrifying and i'm sorry we're gonna stop they're only gonna empower each other more like i'm really worried about what's gonna happen when people try to protest again today there was supposed to be they're supposed to meet it too and it was supposed to be a really mellow peaceful like the naacp was actually leading this one today but they for sure called off their end of it and i'm i'm just worried that Every, at this point, everybody's ready for a riot. And I mean, the upside is that this is, we don't have to wonder what revolutions feel like when they start. Like we're here, the momentum is here. Everyone is saying there's gonna be a riot. And that's when revolutions happen because the way we think collectively, even, even when we're not geographically close, like the collective thinking with the historical pressures Wealth inequality has never been solved by anything but violence. Oppression has never been solved by anything but violence. What worries me, though, is, again, the, the, the fact that we don't have really any sort of political apparatus available to move in and fill the void. Because often what happens when you get a revolutionary violence is that 
the strongest uh, force in the position moves in to fill the void. And I, I don't know who that's going to be in this case. It could be Trump uh, with, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> Jack Boots and, and, or, or it could be it could be the Democrats could come back with like a law and order like Biden presidency. And you yeah. know, it, there's all kinds of ways this could play out and not in our favor. And I, I feel like. I well, mean, here's I, the I only like we way. All, we all really dropped the fucking ball this year. <laughs> like, here's here's like, what we're going to do. Here's what we're all going to do. We're going to pretend like electoralism matters. We're going to pretend like we have an election in the fall. We're almost certainly not going to have an election in the fall. If we do, it'll be it'll be illegitimate. Um, the president doesn't matter. Uh, we've had a brainless president. We don't need a president. We can ignore it. Congress doesn't do anything for us. Why are we listening to them? House of Representatives, what are they doing? None of them are doing anything for us. We don't have to pay attention to it. What we need to do right now is to channel the national momentum that it is time for socialism or barbarism. We have to make a choice and then we implement that choice at home. We don't worry about who's leading the vanguard because we're all leading the vanguard. It's the only way we will be able to do it. And that means at home we're doing mutual aid. It means we're starting bail funds. We're making sure that all of the unions are involved. We're getting every worker involved. We're starting socialist gun clubs. We have to get our people together to take care of each other because it's only going to get worse. The police thing, it's for sure about race. They are racist police. But capitalism is bigger than that. And capitalism is what the cops serve. That's what they protect. So we have to go hard on socialism and we have to do it now. The only way we'll be able to actually accomplish it and maintain like any ground that we get, even just in terms of networking as a local community, the only way we will help ourselves is if we really learn how to help each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's honestly the most important thing is to forget it, forget about politics at all. It doesn't matter who your mayor is. The cops are legitimate. Government's illegitimate. There is no law in this country. So we have to make it ourselves. We can use guidelines. We can use theory. Like we can communicate and use the internet that revolutionaries would have killed for. For yeah. all of history. I but we have to do it. I'm a revolutionary, even though I hear you very well, Erin. And I hear that, um, you know, this is a. Uh, not a government that feels legitimate right now to many, many people. But there are still a lot of people who are maybe silent majority type of people who do not feel that a revolution will help because there's going to be a lot of people dying in a revolution. There's going to be a lot of people. So they should remain silent and let people who have a stake in what's happening actually do the work. So the silent majority, if they're not being affected by it, they have nothing to say, they should stay silent and get out of the way. I well, and I will uh, if the push um, if push yeah, to it. I don't think they will stay silent. I have a great compromise for right. everyone. All, all no of us are socialists. We're not revolutionaries, but we do still live in this country. So the actions of yeah. people who are revolutionaries they will affect us. They will impact us. Okay, so hear me out. Collateral I'm damage not... is probably the most important word here. Okay, so hear me out. We're getting a revolution whether we want one or not. The cops are at war with us whether we fight back or not they're not going to stop. So I'm not saying we're, for me, the revolution, I'm not sending anyone to die. The revolution absolutely is building local communities that can take care of themselves. Where the silent majority, y'all can, everybody can just kind of keep on doing their own thing. While in the background, we work really hard to build a really solid community so that people will see what we're doing and they'll say, you know what? Right now, we all have community gardens. Like, we've all dug up our front lawns. We just get to keep gardens now. And to just keep doing that all across the country, to live the changes that we want to see, so that we're not sending anybody to die, but we're recognizing that the system we have right now is killing us whether we consent to it or not. And that we have to come up with a system so that if this all goes sideways, because they could make it go sideways. Trump could just, Trump alone, he could accidentally nuke his own country. Like, if Trump sends a nuke, no amount of riots is going to stop the nuke. I think what we're talking, like, 
Aaron, you're kind of talking about like a like a anarchist kind of uh, view of socialism, and I think that can kind of serve as like a, a stopgap. In yes, and that's what we need. Our, we need a stopgap, essentially. But the yes. thing is, ultimately, the complexity of our world and our problems, we need a much bigger, much more inclusive uh, movement. We can't simply, we can't no, really exactly rely on, on local. Yeah. I mean, sorry to jump in, but that's exactly what Aaron is talking about. So for me, the reason why I'm uh, so hung up on the silent majority, it, it's more because the silent majority is not really silent. silent. They're telling revolutionaries to stop it, stop rocking the boat instead of helping in their own way. And if they don't want revolutions to be violent, they should help to make things better in a way that works for them they need to be involved they need to stop being silent they need to be okay, involved yeah, exactly. they need to be involved i want in the to thing say is, they're, how they're involved a... is they're making the food come to your table every day they're the ones who are making all of the things happen so people can actually continue living the problem i would the argue that those are and I used to be hang out with the revolutionary communists back in my days in, at Berkeley, all right? So I know about the revolutionary socialism. It's not, the, the main problem is that during the revolution, many people will die. It will be the people who are diabetic, who can't get their insulin. They will be the people who are poor and they already don't have any resources. So when everybody says, okay, we're being very scarcity minded right now, they're not gonna get anything. So the people who are going to die first are the dispossessed that we supposedly are helping, which is the problem. The problem with the revolution is we don't want to take down the infrastructure that keeps things going, which is what scale, which is what she's saying. Well, like, and I'm also I'm not saying it. Not I'm not right saying now. it needs to be a war. I'm not saying it needs to be a war. When, and I think this is part of the thing is that, like, when you're saying um, silent majority, I'm hearing workers. You say silent majority. Well, I hear I'm not parents, a worker I hear either. Babies. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm also, well, I'm actually technically a sex worker, but I'm also disabled. Um, <clears throat> but we're talking, right, we want the people. The people need to be involved. And part of the goal of the revolution is to sell it to the people. Because it isn't about sending bodies anywhere. We're not sending people to war. We're taking care of ourselves. We're building new co-ops. We're building a community that people actually can live in together in a connected way. Like we don't even have mixed use housing in Fort Wayne. We don't, we don't have a single mixed use building. We, so I, I know that we, we normally don't do this. We usually do all our introductions at the beginning, but because your story was so compelling, we really, really wanted to listen to you while you were you know, in the heat of uh, wanting to tell it. Um, I'd like to just introduce everyone so you get to know us and we can also, uh, you know, the people who are watching or listening, some of them can't see our names, so when they're listening, they'll be able to see, uh, hear who we are. Um, is that okay? Okay, let's start with, um, I'll just say my name is Faye, and my um, Twitter is, at Fi um, I'm sorry, Palestine Math, because I live in Palestine, Texas, which is out in East Texas. Hannah, do you want to go? Yeah, uh, my name is Hannah. She, her, um, at now Hannah One. I guess I'm an I'm an activist from Seattle, obviously. Uh, technically, I have left uh, the David Kim campaign officially. I'm now working on uh, hashtag Testify for UBI. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I did not know that, but thank you. Oh, oh yeah, it's I have we haven't really made it public yet. Yeah. Shale, do you want to uh, take over the? Monitor? Oh yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Faye, one of our two assistant producers, the other being uh, Jeremy. There's some background noise. I'm the producer of the show, so I'll only address this background noise. Where's that coming from? Oh, it's probably, I'm on the porch now. It's uh, probably that's what me. It is. Okay. How well, do I press mute? There should be a software mute button somewhere. Um, are you on a laptop can I just, phone? Can I say thank you and goodbye? Yeah, yeah she's got to go. I mean, well, let's, you know what? Let's just say hello to you. Um, so, yeah, I'll just think about well, you. I'm Shale. You know who I am. I'm at S H A E L R I L E Y on Twitter. We are uh, old as friend so um so uh, i'll go let ben aaron will you be coming back if you take off now i would i would i would come back if you would have me again you were this was a delight my voice is usually a lot more radio worthy yeah i'd like you to come I, back I, did as I, much did as you like. we have four shows entire... a weekend and you're welcome anytime to be one of our regular speakers or just periodic speakers anytime you're welcome wait, wait.
Yeah, yeah, we have another one at three o'clock. You have another one. Yeah. Particularly, you. if you're available you. tomorrow, there was something I wanted to ask you that you touched on. You touched on socialist gun clubs. Um, I wanted oh, to, yeah. I wanted to talk about that more in depth with you, but you can do that tomorrow because I, I am oh, interested yeah. in how that presence might have affected protests. Yeah, you can message each other on Discord. You know, you guys. Uh, are I have a gun. I absolutely did not bring it. I would never. <laughs> like. No. For the best. No. 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 Then again. That said, I'm not going to another protest with a protest sign. Yeah. <laughs> like they, oh, they told know. us that was a bad idea. So Wait, thank you all. Did this, did this start an hour ago? Or it, it did. We were saying goodbye. And we want to just get through everybody before uh, Aaron has to go. Oh, She's yeah. so good. She's so tired. And thank Aaron, I want to say thank you so much for coming on. You are an inspiring leader. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you've said. And I want to thank you again for having the courage to stand up and put your body on the line and do what you did for everyone here last night. So thank you. And, no, thank um, you. Know, yeah, we, you're a great. We're all allies, even if we are not agreeing on how to, to, to get this done. And it's great. Oh, so, uh, and they were aiming at me. They were aiming at me specifically way, way too much for me to risk rubber bullets. They really, no, I've, I've got a, I've got a kind of bigger target on my forehead right now than I expected to have, but it's part of the game. You got to walk the walk. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you very oh, much. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> have, a, have a good rest. Yeah. Thank you. I actually uh, probably be ducking out too. Well, I was well, at me at Songbird on Twitter and uh, special needs mom. And I got to go take care of him now because uh, I kind of ducked out real quick to come join in on this. I appreciate thank you coming guys. Nice short to notice see and, you. And yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming. I am also going to go. Absolutely. I love you guys. We do our later episodes. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's really good to see you here. Yeah. Well, let's, we can say goodbye. Uh, ben, do you want to just introduce yourself and say goodbye? Yeah, my name is Ben. Thanks so much for coming. Well, hold on, Ben. Who are you? What do you do? Tell um, us something I'm in Brooklyn, uh -huh. and I'm. What uh, campaign did you volunteer for? Uh, the Warren campaign, and mm -hmm. I'm involved with a group in the fight that grew out of Rep that. Your block. Uh, in Brooklyn, rep, so, is it rep your block, right? Rep your block is a is a different effort. That's like okay, a that's community election thing. I'm running for the tiniest little electoral position you could possibly have. What um, is that? Uh, oh, that's um. I want to know. A it's a Democratic Party membership group. So it's like the committee that runs every the little bit matters. matters. Yep. So we're gonna uh, you, 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 look. I mean, if you improve your rank within that organization, <laughs> you improve your degree of agency cool. and allyship. So I'm yeah, I'm we gotta to infiltrate, man. Um, that's, so thanks, that's thanks, the man. plan. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you coming. You know, you you do have a different perspective than than most people here. Um, and you're still, you know, we're still on the same side here. Um, so Ariel, yeah, being uh, patient. No problem. I am at Ariel's underscore Armada. So that's A R I. E L S underscore A R M A D A. And uh, I am a YouTuber. You can find me at youtube.com slash revolutionary thinking. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, we'll see you again in a bit, I think. Um, and Jeremy, are you here? Hi, this is Jeremy. Uh, I am probably ide ideologically on the opposite end of the spectrum when it comes to this situation, but um, it was interesting to sit in on this conversation. Thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, I can be reached at Jeremy Sammons one and that is J-E-R-E-M-Y-S-A-M-M-O-N-S -E -M -M -S and the number one. You know, we need multiple perspectives represented. So thank you. Thank you for being candid, and we'll talk more about that soon. Yeah, that's, that's the room. So wow, what a heavy episode. Yeah. Goodbye. Hey, did we get Moto? Oh, we, I did skip Moto. I'm sorry. You know, it's hard to. That's all right. Let's get more. Moto, Kale's roommate and the uh, socialist dungeon. curmudgeon. Dungeon master. Dungeon master. And, he's one of, uh, actually he's one of my political gurus, and he's been a big political <laughs> That's the truth. I'm, so, I'm uh, the dungeon master. <laughs> so, someday I'll explain my politics in detail, but it's uh, not today. <laughs> I'm at uh, Moto Motes on Twitter with uh, underscore between the two words. Here we have Dan Larson and uh, a number of other guests coming to talk about how to inspire basic income support on the Republican side of the aisle and how to inspire Republicans to run for Congress on a basic income platform, if that can be done. I, maybe you can. I mean, Dan, Dan's doing it. So, <sighs> yeah, thank you again for coming. It's just such a crazy, surreal time. Every day more surreal than the last. Um, take care of yourselves. Take care of everyone you can. And um, thank you for listening.